My dear friends, media evangelization is a phrase we have often read and heard in our classes. It is a favorite slogan in many church fora and seminars like this one. But what does it really mean? As early as the Second Vatican Council, the Council Fathers, in their document Intermirifica, called for the Church to make use of media in her work of spreading the Word of God. At that time, there was no social media yet. How has the Church responded to this call? Today, allow us to share our experiences in answering the Vatican II's challenge of media evangelization. Jesuit Communications has been in existence for the last 30 years. We produce shows in mainstream media, mass media, and we are on TV, radio, print, social media. Our music ministry, which was begun by Father Eddie Pontiveros SJ, a former dean of LST, has had great influence in our church's liturgy and worship. In 2015, during the visit of the Pope, Pope Francis, we were also tasked to organize the media coverage of his visit as well as the official, produce the official documentation for the Philippine Church. Our latest project, an incursion into filmmaking, was a biopic on our Jesuit founder, Ignacio de Loyola, which continues to be shown worldwide. Currently, it is on its third week in Mexico. With this wealth and hopefully depth of media experience behind us, our track record, as they say, we wish to now share valuable lessons learned in this very challenging ministry of media evangelization. My dear friends, we are very fortunate this morning to have as our main speaker, our very own Luis Antonio Cardinal Tagle, Archbishop of Manila. We thank him because despite his busy, very busy schedule as Cardinal and Archbishop, he has continued to teach here at LST. Let's give him a round of applause for that. After his short remarks, we shall have three shorter reactions from a panel of media practitioners, all collaborators of JESCOM as well. Then we will open the floor for an open forum in which you can direct questions to all our speakers. Shall we begin then? Yes. For our opening remarks, we will introduce our speaker in terms of his background in media since we are talking about media evangelization. He was then Bishop of Faraway, Imus Cavite, when he was discovered by Jesuit communications, this poor boy, articulate and yet very profound. He began as a favorite resource person for churches' video documentaries, then, he became part of Kapet Pandasal, which is a two-minute daily prayer segment at ABS-CBN, and which has just turned 15 years old this month. Another show was given him, him to host, Light Talk, which aired for five years at ABC-5. But his big break came with his Sunday show, entitled The Word Exposed. Who among you here uh, watch The Word Exposed? Okay, only the priests who need homilies. <laughs> the said show, The Word Exposed, has turned 10 years, last, 10 years old last year. So congratulations to the Cardinal again. The show has been very successful in that it is solely financed. So as the director of Jesuit Communications, this is my main concern. It is solely financed by the Cardinal's millions of adoring fans, not just here in the Philippines, but all over the world. My dear friends, as a systematic theologian, 
our speaker will briefly outline for us the instructions of the Church on media evangelization, as well as share reflections from his own experience or praxis. Let us therefore welcome now the President of Caritas Internationalis and the Catholic Biblical Association, who Vatican correspondent John Allen calls the rock star of the Catholic Church. My dear friends, our very own Luis Antonio Cardinal Tagle. We are to rise when the Cardinal Uh, uh, good morning, good morning. Please remain standing. Uh, why are you laughing? I'm serious. Uh, this is supposed to be an act of solidarity. You, know? uh, you better, better take your seats now. Now, greetings to everyone. We thank uh, Loyola School of Theology for uh, this lively, lively uh, moment in theological and pastoral formation called the Theological Hour. We thank you for maintaining it. I don't know how many years uh, Theological Hour has been in existence. 1998, so that means uh, 21 21 years, wow. So congratulations to the Theological Hour. And we also celebrate uh, this arm of uh, the Society of Jesus, which is now called Jesuit Communications. When I was a seminarian, I started collaborating with Father uh, Eduardo Ontiveros, that first recording with the... Uh, San Jose Mangagawa Choir no? uh, of Filipino uh, music. Uh, it was not called yet at the time the Jesuit music ministry, but it was the beginning. I was still a seminarian then. And then, uh, yeah, how can you escape LST and how can you escape from the clutches of Jesuit communication? You cannot. So that's why I'm up to now, I am a prisoner of, uh, of, of, of their mission. And it is good. 15 years of Cape at Pandasal. And uh, Father Nono and I are, the, are part of the original uh, cast. And I, I can't believe that it has been 15 years of uh, reflection in prayer. And why do I continue? I, I, I told people when I was named Archbishop of Manila, I started enumerating the things that I probably should let go of because of the added uh, responsibilities. But then, before I could file my letter of resignation to the boss. I happened to meet a policeman. He recognized me and said, Bishop, thanks to you, thanks to Kapet Pandasal, because of my work hours, I usually start working very early or I prepare to go home early in the morning. So I catch Kape at Pandasal. He said, there was one Tuesday, because I, I appear on Tuesday. He said, I was confused. I didn't know what to do with my life. I listened to your prayer. That was what I needed to hear that day. God spoke to me. So thank you. I did not know the guy. I don't even remember what I said. But God could touch people. And the means used was Kapet Pandasal. 
and a bishop who was also confused. But he gave me the idea, no, don't write that letter to Father Nono. Just continue. So we're still here. 15 years of service. Ay, naku. I think my role here is... Uh, uh, thank you. So does that mean I should end my, my <laughs> presentation? Okay. Uh, my, my role here is, uh, as, as Father Nono said, maybe just to uh, remind us of what the Church, especially since Vatican II, has been telling us about media evangelization. You know, the document, the decree that uh, Father Nono mentioned, inter mirifica, the decree on social communications, was one of the two first documents promulgated by Vatican II in 1963. The Constitution on the Liturgy and this one. So at the beginning of Vatican II, this decree was already in place. Some people were saying, probably if the Council had waited, <laughs> this decree would have acquired a different flavor with Gaudium et Spes and with uh, all the other uh, constitutions on dialogue with other religions. But by God's grace, it was one of the first, first documents that came from the Ecumenical Council. And in the history of the Church, this is the first time that an Ecumenical Council addresses the issue of communication and evangelization. So just a review. Means of communication. That's why we call them media. Medium. Means of communication. Vatican II rejoices at the advance in the discovery and development of new means of communication. For Vatican II, they reveal to us the genius of the human spirit. And the Church welcomes these new means. They are a potential for the Church to reach people with the Gospel and to help the Church promote what we call the social teachings of the Church, human development, our vision of human development, and social transformation. But the Church also watches with concern, with vigilance, the means of social communication, because sometimes they contribute to insecurity and not always to nourishment. And often they could operate outside the realm of ethical and moral norms. But when Vatican II talked about the means of social communications, it is not just radio, television, or what we call now social media that the Council had in mind. Probably the Council had no idea yet of internet and all of those things. Included in social communications are what the press, of course, radio, television, cinema. That's why Jesuit communications, yeah, more movies. Maybe Jesuit communications and LST could sponsor uh, a Catholic uh, film fest or something. Theater, theater as also one of the means of social communication. Music, drama, the arts, all of them 
are included in the means of communicating the gospel. Now, Vatican II invites us to develop the right consciousness regarding the use of this means of communication. Three simple points. First, information. The means of social communications are supposed to inform and to give accurate, truthful information. Vatican II even uh, dwelt on news, publications, etc. But how to inform people so that people would grow in knowledge and by that knowledge contribute to the common good. This aspect has changed dramatically. Our society is called an information society. But what is information used for now? Is it for knowledge? Is it to invite people so that through this knowledge they could contribute to the common good? We need a serious study on the contemporary brand of information society that we have. And I will not explain it so that you would search what is the quality of contemporary information society. Is it for knowledge? Is it for the common good? Or for other purposes? The second invitation of the Council, the connection between art, art and the means of social communication. Especially nowadays, when people invoke the right, the human right to expression, said, how about the norms of morality, artistic freedom? Many people invoke artistic freedom and the right to communicate their vision of beauty. I am the oldest probably among the JESCOM uh, collaborators here. And look at how happy Father Nono is. Yeah, you are the oldest. <laughs> yeah. But when I was a, a young boy and the movies were still in black and white, when a man ran after a girl. You, know? you see the girl removing her hands so quickly. Women were quick to take their hands away from the clutches of the males. And when they finally meet, and oh, at the moment of kissing, the camera goes up. And you see the clouds, you see the birds, you know, did they kiss? You do not know. You know, it's left open. There are some things that are not meant to be seen. That was the norm then. Now you see everything. And that is the norm of truth. If you do not show everything, they say you are not truthful. So what does it mean now for an information society to propose art and the art as a vessel, as an instrument of the true, the good, the beautiful? And the third challenge from Vatican II is, oh, this is important. Vatican II was also quite concerned how is moral evil depicted in movies, in news reporting? Vatican II was saying, yes, you report evil, but be cautious 
Sometimes, evil is reported in a manner that glamorizes evil. And you leave, you leave like the theater, you leave the, uh, the, 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 the news broadcast believing that evil is stronger than good, then that is not the good news. Evil has been put on the pedestal. So Vatican II is, 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 is uh, inviting us to enter into that very delicate issue. You report evil, but by what norm are you reporting it? Are you glamorizing evil already in your manner of reporting? I used to teach eschatology, the last things, death, judgment, hell, heaven. And in one, one uh, final examination, oral examination, I asked one student about hell and the theories of hell. He explained hell beautifully. He was almost attracting me to enter hell. <laughs> I got disturbed. And then I said, oh, how long? okay, let us turn to heaven. It was a lackluster, you know, mediocre presentation of heaven. I said, look, why is hell <laughs> more attractive in your explanation? You know? And when it came to heaven, nothing, nothing that would motivate me to say, I want to go to heaven. I said, so even in theology, beware. Heaven and hell are not on equal footing. Evil and good are not on equal footing. Good is victorious. But in our reporting, Vatican II is saying, are we, because of lack of critical, exercise of critical faculties, spirituality and morality, are we glamorizing evil? The evil that we are supposed to condemn, we have glamorized because of the way we communicated it. <sighs> Should I end now? Mm -hmm. Up to one o'clock? <laughs> no, no. No. So, uh, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, other points uh, raised by Vatican II. Public opinion is at stake in our use of media. And nowadays, young people are hooked no? <laughs> to the, 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 the wonderful and surprising means of communicating. But Vatican II asks the church to get involved in the world of, so, of social communications, to get involved in public affairs, and what are our contributions? To bring to the attention of readers, viewers, listeners, their duty to discern, to discern what is true. But that means <laughs> that we have already given them prior formation in discernment. We can always say, discern, discern, discern. But are we guiding people you know, in how to discern? The youth, the youth, young people are mentioned by Vatican II as needing guidance so that they could acquire a self-critical attitude towards their use of, of media and also 
to use them with moderation. Nowadays, we are, we are uh, aware of this form of addiction. There are now uh, rehab, rehab uh, centers for those who are addicted to social media. And I'm sure there are more of them than those addicted to drugs. So maybe LSD could have a course on that. Running a detox center. Yeah, uh, there, there are now writings asking the church to study digital detox. Maybe Jescom could also uh, provide that. Uh, newscasters, writers, actors, producers, directors, distributors of materials are all mentioned by Vatican II. Please clarify for yourselves your motivation. Are you really there to inform people, to form their knowledge? Are you there to help them become good citizens? Or, as observed by some stud, uh, scholars on the prevailing atmosphere of contemporary information society, is it truthfulness or class propaganda? Is it truthfulness or capitalist business interests? So all those who are involved in, in, uh, in the production. Civil authorities are also mentioned by Vatican II to protect a true and just availability of information and the public, public authority should see to it that morals are not eliminated in the dissemination of information. So the church has a role to play. In fact, I wonder, with all those people mentioned by Vatican II, is the church offering some sort of a formation program to them? Maybe it is time. In our involvement in media evangelization, maybe we should offer evangelization to these main uh, stakeholders. The directors, the writers, the actors, the newscasters, the producers, you know, and those who are the bloggers. Maybe that would be one. And uh, in the recent writings of, of the popes, we are made to realize that when we're talking about evangelization, media evangelization, we are not just talking about training on how to use the media, the means of communication. We need to learn them, but also to evangelize that world. Media, social media especially, is a world in itself. It has its own language. It has its own mindset. You know, uh, I am a digital migrant. I learned how to use the computer at an advanced age. And how afraid I was the first time I handled the computer. And maybe those of my generation, do you remember that those big floppy disks? Yung mga itim black ones, you know, them, yeah, right, no? and when you turn it up, <laughs> the cars are quieter than the computers, and big, big ones, no? Yeah, 
and uh, really, and then came the laptop, etc. And now everything is in your cell phone, etc. I used to communicate with my parents when I was a student in the U.S. by phone, and I had to pass through the operator. Huh? Remember that? Th those were the days. They asked you, what number are you calling? You, know, you give the number. Who will pay? Of course, collect call. <laughs> 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 and I had a, a, a piece of paper with all the messages because you don't want to go on and on and on and on. The bill <laughs> will also go on and on and on. So you chose the message. You had to be clear, to be concise because of that. No? And you're, when my mother would say, hey, how are you later, mom? Let, let me get to the point. Things like those, no? Yeah. And once in a while, you get you you lift the, the, the phone, and there's somebody already talking, party line, and you say, please, please, let me use it first. Now, all of these things. But now, no, it is not just about means. It has developed to an extent that it is already a world in itself. They are not only means that we use for evangelization. It is a world that needs to be evangelized itself. There are opportunities for the church and for society in the digital revolution, as they call it. Very clearly, evangelization. Thanks to the means of, of communication, the mass of Pope Francis in Abu Dhabi was not just an event in Abu Dhabi. It really was a universal, worldwide event, thanks to social communications. So evangelization, solidarity in society, what they call the cyber communities formed because of causes. You see Hong Kong? and Catalan now getting together. Not geographically, but through social communications. Same causes. Advancing the church's mission. Uh, before coming up here, I was met at the parlor by a French brother of Teze. Are you familiar with Teze? Yeah. I visited Teze last July. And he told me, you know, we forgot to tell you when you visited that the brothers of Teze, we watch the word exposed for our meditation. He said, we have your CDs. I said, really? I said, yeah. I could not be in France all the time, but thanks to this, no? You could you reach, you reach them, advancing the mission, deepening our faith through prayer, cultivation of shared knowledge, and providing help to people in existential questions. Like yesterday, I learned that through social media, a Filipina OFW, I won't mention the country, who is undergoing so much distress and abuse, was able to connect with her family here. And the family connected with someone working for Pondo ng Pinoy. She connected with the Philippine Embassy in Andre. And the woman now is safe. Huh? Extracted. So all those wonders. However, there are threats, noise, and lack of silence. You're always connected. And the, the manipulation of the mind, what we call fake news. Forgetting our neighbor because my cell phone is more important than the person next to me. In fact, there was a, a survey, you know, if you, if you are uh, 
if you are on your way to work and you discovered that you have left behind your wallet and your mobile phone, what will bring you back home? It's not the wallet. It's the mobile phone. So I asked in a family gathering, what if you forgot your wife? Will you return home to bring your wife? I said, no. <laughs> you might forget the human being. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the gadget is more important. The source of hatred, how hatred could spread through the means of social communication. Narcissism, emptiness, emptiness. And unfortunately, also the quest for external stimulation. And now, with the dark web, so many, so many cases of assisted suicide among the young targeting their sense of emptiness and loneliness. And the online exploitation of minors, prostitution, slavery. In the past, it needed a physical, physical uh, movement, taking a, a minor to be sold as a slave or a prostitute. Now, Unfortunately, even parents sell their children online. And they say, well, it is not real abuse. The client is uh, miles and miles away. The client does not touch my child. I am the mother. I'm touching the child. So this is not abuse. Real virtual. Is that real abuse? The parent says, no. At worst, it is virtual. Can you tell the child who has been manipulated, child, this is not real abuse. This is virtual. So as we rejoice, we see also you know, the potentials, but also the threats. And I end here. And uh, the, the experiences of the young ones you know, uh, I, uh, are, are, are more important. No. So thank you for your, for your patience. Thank you. Thank you, Cardinal Tagle. We will hear more of uh, Cardinal Tagle later. For now, uh, leading off our panel of reactors to share his own reflections on media evangelization, in particular on how we can reach the youth or the so-called millennials and Gen Z via media is Father Giselle Gerard Gonzalez, SJ. Father J. Boy was ordained as a Jesuit priest in 2001 after his theological studies here at LST. He is now the Assistant Principal for Formation in the Senior High School of the Ateneo de Davao University. He is ho also host of Capet Pandasal and is very well known for his active presence in social media. Friends, let us now welcome Father J. Boy Gonzalez, SJ. Magandang umaga po. Ako po si Father J. Boy at tayo na po at magkapet pandasal. So good morning everyone. And I'm very happy that I'm really in front of you to share my experiences, especially in terms of doing my uh, social media ministry to both the millennials or Gen Y and the present generation which is Gen Z. And they're totally different from many of us because all of us, including myself and some of you, you look Gen X. They are so different that they're also very, very exciting. So let me begin. SKL, do you know SKL? Raise your hands. 
What is SKL? Hashtag SKL. Yes, very good. Share ko lang. Or let me share. Kailangan ko mag-English, di ba? So, so let me share my experiences first. One of the things that I like about Pope Francis because he has the right words to describe how we have to do our mission. And one of the things that he said is that we have to begin from where they are or to go where they are. I remember my ministry as a priest in UP Diliman. My pastoral strategy was to visit dormitories, buildings, and talk to the students and the adult community, which means members of the faculty, staff, or even those who would just visit UP. All I did really was to converse with them and to engage them because they have a lot of questions. I would go to the education building, which was reputed to be the bastion of atheism, the arts and sciences walk, engineering, economics, and accountancy building. The engineering building has with me a very beautiful experience. It was in the engineering building with the fraternity called Beta F that I had my best mass. Why? Because I was on stage and there was a spotlight. But the most memorable of all of my experiences was in 2005. I was in UP in 2003, and I ended my ministry at 2008, at least officially, because I continue to guide many people from UP until today. But in 2005, I was invited by students from the Fine Arts Building, and they asked me if I could say the Mass and bless their artworks. So I readily obliged. The attendees were the Chancellor at that time, Chancellor Sergio Cao, who was not a Catholic, and President Emerlinda Roman, and other UPD dignitaries. But most of them were students. They met me and led me to a room with a spotlight off the altar table at the center of a gallery. So there I was without any sacristan or the usual entourage. I began preparing the altar. And then I looked around and began to realize that surrounding the altar were all nude paintings. I was told that never try to show shock. So, I kept my composure, mastering all of my theater skills, my acting, and I smiled. Thank you very much for inviting me. Even though I was so uncomfortable, even it was my first time doing a mask surrounded by nude paintings, I said to myself, let me do my work, Lord. And I did. But then, there are many things that you would also notice during that Mass. The students were all awkward. Many students from UP Diliman came from public schools. They are not accustomed to a Catholic Mass. And by the way, they also look a little bit scary than usual with long hair, and they were dirty. Their hands, their shirts were covered with paint. And they looked at me this way. But I knew that they invited me. I knew that they had this desire to, to have God as the beginning of their fine arts week. I knew Sorry. I knew that that was their desire because in UP, the Mass is not given. In UP, you've got to be invited and you should not erase the invitation. You have to present proof that you were invited. You cannot say, I'd like to say Mass. 
they have to tell you, you say, Father, can you say mass for us? So I did the mass. And lo and behold, yes, they were awkward. Yes, they didn't know what to do. I had to guide them. But then they began singing. I tell you, the singing was not really spectacular. The singing was not even in the right tone. But they were singing with all of their hearts. And that moved me. And so during the homily, I was trained by the Jesuits that do the most out of a situation. So during the homily, I have to connect the nude paintings with the gospel. And I began by saying about artworks in the Vatican, incorporated composition, color, and message. And then they began to smile. They began to be relaxed. They received communion with their dirty hands and fingernails. And they continued to sing songs. At the end of the Mass, they invited me to bless something outside of the gallery. They were mandalas. How many of you here know mandalas? Usually in Buddhist, Hinduism, that's a form of spiritual art. The mandalas were on the ground, and they used colored stones to create the color and the design of the mandalas. And they began to explain to me why they have conceptualized the mandalas and how they conceptualize their designs. I tell you one thing. Yes, I did bless the mandalas, but I think I was blessed more than I blessing them because when they explained it, it was spiritual, it was deep, it was sincere, it was very, very authentic. Their words were far better in articulating God than my own homily. My dear brothers and sisters, this experience encapsulates my work in social media and the strategy I use for Kapet Pandasal. Go to where they are, listen to the people whom you are talking to, use their language, and then in accompaniment, bring them to God. My work in media has its base and source the needs of the young, age around 13 years old to 39. The Makan Erickson Youth Survey of 2018 says it ends at 35. But for the Catholic Church in World Youth Day, it ends at 39. I better use 39 because I'm still Catholic. Or for many of you who are young at heart, you see the young, the millennials, Gen Y and Gen Z, ask the same questions which many of us ask when we were young. It's usually about identity. Who am I? The second, community. To whom do I belong to? And third, it is about purpose. What is the meaning, purpose, and direction of my life? Knowing these perennial questions, both from all of us, baby boomers, Gen Z, Gen Y, Gen X, the approach will always be different because the times are different. And to approach Gen Y and Gen Z, one has to use social media. I tried to experiment on the use of social media and I tell you, and in front of you, I really apologize for many of my mistakes. I have more failures than successes. I have been called by the provincial, by my superiors, by fellow Jesuits. I've said sorry to some politicians. And I guess I have said sorry many times. But to me, going through social media, 
as a means of communicating the Word of God, we need to experiment. We need to be creative, to find new ways in order to be relevant to the younger generation. My scripts for Kapet Pandasal are geared towards not just information, but formation. Because that is my work in school. My work in school and my passion is about forming the younger generation, as it also forms me. They are from my experiences. Somewhere in 2005, I had a blog. It's called Faith of a Centurion in Blogspot. And in 2005, I published my homilies, hoping that some people who will not be able to attend my mass will be able to read them. In 2010, I got a letter from a group of people from the Middle East. And they came and visited me. And you know what they said? They came from Saudi Arabia. There was no mass. They used my homily as an alternative for the mass and use it for sharing and use it for their prayer. Somewhere after 2010, I entered into social media, not just blogging, but actually putting my videos on YouTube and engaging people on Twitter and Instagram, also Facebook. But now, Gen Y and Gen Z are on Twitter and Instagram. But then, what do I publish? I publish on my blog, it's called jboygonzalez.com, in WordPress, the scripts. The scripts now are about mental health. A season is about social media behavior, including what our dear Cardinal said, social media diet, that's what we call it. Or gives yourself some time out of social media. It helps. Another was about what to remember when you are going through hell and how to find your happiness. There I told them two things which acquired a lot of likes and shares and retweets and comments. The first thing is what you already know in faith life. To be happy, to find meaning in life, to remember when you are going through hell. It is always about gratitude. To put into the fore the graces the Lord has given us. And I have to re uh, remind our younger generation why in Facebook it is always toxic. It is not about gratitude. It is often about entitlement. It is often about what is wrong with another person or with another situation. The same thing on Twitter. And I get all the hashtags from my students whom I follow in order for me to know their language. And from there, we get to see one thing. Our young people, they continue to search for, for God. Whatever they say, it is always a search for that which lasts. For that which, at the end of their day, who matters to them? For that, at the end of their life, what would people say about them? And they all said, I want to change the world. That's their desire. That's in the McCann Erickson Youth Survey of 2018, even 2005. They want to change the world. And so, my dear friends, just to end, my experience in social media has taught me a lot of things. It has taught me that priesthood is about... <laughs> Sorry. At this day and age, priesthood acquires more meaning when you are able to listen to people. To the young people, especially that of Gen Z, hardly understood by many 
of my co-batch mates, Gen X. People, even in religious life, I talked to them last Saturday when I gave a talk to temporary professed religious sisters and seminarians who also underwent misunderstanding from their superiors who belong to Gen X. We only discovered that indeed, these young people, they want to change the world. They want to change people's lives, but in their own terms, in their own way. Maybe not perhaps when we were young. I was young in 1985 when Michael Jackson and Madonna were still beginning and Cindy Lauper was uh, singing uh, True Colors and Tears for Fears and Baguettes was at the top of the movie charts. Not anymore. For Jen, why? The way that we would parent them does not apply anymore. There should be another way. But let me la use this as a means to challenge everyone. The objective of our mission remains the same. It is to preach the word of God. It is to help and participate in the grace of God as the Lord builds the kingdom of God here on earth. It remains the same and it will not change. But people, they have a context. And we have to know the context in order to use their language so that they will understand God's love. And so, to many of you, including myself, just one thing. Please stop being boring. Sometimes it is in the words of the church and church people who would say, our life is ordinary because of our demore, because of our schedule in the convent or in the seminary. But I tell you one thing, if you say our life is ordinary, why did we enter religious life? Why did we become priests or brothers or sisters? Why do you want to enter this work of the Lord? To me, I think, on the contrary, because we found our happiness, because we found our life exciting, because I tell you one thing, you know what I share to many young people? I tell them, my life as a Jesuit is exciting. And you know what they ask? Father, share to us, SKL, what is exciting? And one asked me, I'd like to become a Jesuit. And I said, why? Because it is exciting. No one is attracted by suffering. We are attracted by joy. I think all of us here should be people of joy. That's the resurrection. Thank you, Father Javo, and thank you for traveling all the way from Davao to share your insights on this topic, Just Mabalos. We will now move on to our next reactor. We will introduce him now. Medyo kinakabahan. He now feels like a stranger in a strange land, or in an alien territory, or in a lion's den. Jo joking lang, Father. Our next and final speaker graduated from San Carlos Seminary in 2013 and was ordained as priest of the Archdiocese of Manila by Cardinal Tagle on December 7, 2013. He is now the Vice Rector of the Manila Cathedral, so be kind to him if you want someday to use the cathedral. <laughs> he is also the Minister for Liturgical Music of the Archdiocese. He was discovered by JESCOM last January this year. He is also therefore one of the hosts of Capet Pandasal and is now here to share with us about his very fresh experience as newbie media celebrity and especially why we must embrace this ministry courageously. 
My dear friends, please welcome Father Kali Yamado of the Archdiocese of Manila. Hello, good morning. A few weeks back, I received an email from Father Nono about, the, about this uh, theological hour. And uh, he emailed to me the details of this uh, theological hour. And uh, it was written there, the titles of every talk. And he gave me a title for my talk. The title was, Becoming a Celebrity. So, <laughs> so I asked Father No, no, maybe it may come across very confrontational, no? becoming a celebrity. So I will try to change the title, Father No, no, kung okay lang, no. Instead of becoming a celebrity, pwede bang the reluctant celebrity. Then <laughs> biro lang po, no? But uh, let me just share to you two points about. Uh, I'm really conscious about this because my bishop is here. No? I am directly under the authority of Cardinal Tagle. So please, Cardinal Tagle. No? Uh, um, let me just share to you two points of my experience on uh, using social media in our evangelization. First is visibility and the other is faith. Just two things, visibility and faith. First, visibility. How visible are we in social media. Many of us may not be aware that we are already digital natives. Sometimes we see ourselves as digital migrants. No? But in fact, many of us already are digital natives because according to the recent survey, Filipinos spend 10 hours a day using social media, using the internet. And according to Pope Benedict, social media or the digital culture, the digital world, is not really anymore a parallel world from the real world. Sometimes it is already the real world where we are moving. So the question is, are we visible in the digital world? Let me just share to you how I began my ministry using social media. I was assigned in 2015 uh, by Cardinal Tagle at the Manila Cathedral as assistant rector. And when I arrived at the Manila Cathedral, I noticed there were very few people visiting the cathedral. How many of you have visited the Manila Cathedral? There, there are some who have not raised their hands. No? <laughs> Maybe you have not visited the Manila Cathedral. And so when I arrived at the Manila Cathedral, um, we tried to, to, to do an informal survey to different people. What do you think of the Manila Cathedral? What is the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of the Manila Cathedral? Sige, I will give you five seconds. What is the first mind that comes to you when you think of the Manila Cathedral? There were two answers. The most answers. Number one, wedding church. Tama ba ako? Now, wedding church. Now, we have 300 to 350 weddings a year in the Manila Cathedral. Number two, this is funny, no? The church interior is dark. So, that's the second thing that they remember about the Manila Cathedral. So, at least they remembered something. So, two things, wedding church and the church is dark. So, that's it. So, they do not know anything about the Manila Cathedral. And so, I thought of using social media to promote the Manila Cathedral and how they could, you know, appreciate once more the story of the Manila Cathedral. In fact, we even hired a, which, who is a friend of mine, no? a branding company. No? They analyzed everything. So, how do you brand yourself? No? Baka, how, what is your logo? What is your motto? So, we tried to rebrand and called the Manila Cathedral the Mother Church. So now we are using that title, the Mother Church. And many people have come already you know, to the Manila Cathedral and uh, through the help of uh, Jesuit communications, dito po pumasok yung aking story with the Jesuit communications. No? Kasi I asked Father Reggie, our rector, uh, who can we ask for help for social media evangelization? And there is this one thing that came into our mind, 
which for us is the best in social media evangelization, which is Jesuit communication. So, sabi ni Father Reggie, tamang-tama, I know one person in Jescom, no? si Ernestine. Siya kasi yung pinakamakulit palagi, nagpapaschedule kay Cardinal. No? So, ako, siya naman ang kulitin natin. So, we contacted Ernestine and we tried to collaborate with Jesuit communication. So, we staged concerts, musicals, and just recently we produced a, uh, a documentary about the Manila Cathedral. And now we are also using social media not only to promote the cathedral, but in our day-to-day -day lives as Christians in our faith. So when people contact us, what is your schedule for masses? So the, the, the social media page would automatically you know, send the, the schedule of masses so they know what time are the masses at the cathedral. And since 2015, we have, uh, fi we have found an increase, no? 50 to 70% of mass goers na ganun kadami ang nadagdag sa Manila Cathedral. And also for weddings, we also use now the social media. Uh, for example, if they want to schedule a wedding, they do not need to come to the office they could first check the calendar in our website and see if that schedule is still available. They could also download the forms. They could already fill up the forms at home. So when they go to the office, uh, it will not take a long time to process all of these because they have already filled everything up online. Diba po maganda? Na sabi nga nila, the only thing that is not online is the wedding itself. No? So, pero hindi pwede. No? Hindi pwede. We cannot do online weddings. No? But they could schedule. Huh? They could schedule weddings. They could download the forms online. Also, when we are to invite people for our events, for different liturgical celebrations, we do not anymore print posters. No? Tipid pa. No, we do not anymore print posters. We post the posters on social media. And there is this one thing that we learned. For your event to be really, you know, famous, you need to put the picture of Cardinal Tagle. <laughs> So, sorry, Cardinal. Ha? <laughs> but uh, we, we noticed that, you know, when, when they learn that Cardinal Tagle will celebrate the Mass or Cardinal Tagle will sing during the concert, you know, people will really come. No? So, Cardinal, sorry po kung ginamit namin kayo no? <laughs> sa mga posters. No? But uh, uh, I think that is how, you know, we could use social media to really invite people to come to church, to celebrate Masses with us. And uh, for example, another example is just recently we uh, released a new mass setting, uh, yung pista ng sambayanan, uh, composed by the eminent, uh, I saw him earlier, Father Manuling Francisco. And yun nga, no, we didn't release any posters. We just posted the schedule of the launch. We even posted um, instructional videos. So the ordinary church choirs in the parishes, they can just watch in YouTube and learn how to sing the songs. So social media can really be a very important and helpful tool for evangelization. Visibility. Is your parish, is your community visible in social media? And secondly and lastly, faith. We need to share faith in social media. Not faith that is intellectual, not about trivias about the faith, not really that. No? I found that the greatest number of uh, engagement of posts come when the post is about prayer. When it is a prayer, when the post is about a prayer, the simple faith of people. You know, I, I have a friend who is a Protestant and I cannot forget this, uh, this comment from her. She told me, why do you Catholics love suffering? Sabi ko bakit, no? Why do you love suffering? Why? So why did you say that? Because one time I asked a priest to, to pray over me because I was sick. And 
the priest just said in the, pray, in the prayer that if you will it, Lord, heal her. But if you do not will it, just let her endure the suffering. Why don't you just say, heal her, Lord? <laughs> you know, because, you know, for Protestant, uh, don't you read the scriptures? Jesus did not say, uh, you will be healed if God wills it, but if not, you will suffer. No, no. Jesus just said, you will be healed. No? You will be given grace by God. And I thought that was, you know, powerful. And I, I will not forget that uh, suggestion from her that every time I, I do my scripts in Kapet Pandasal, I remember to always end my prayer with that kind of faith. Simple faith. No? It's not really about, you know, explaining to her theology, but simple faith. God will heal you. God will listen to you. God will not abandon you. Those are the things that people really listen to in social media. And I think the church can really say something about this. So visibility, are we visible in social media? And do we really spread faith in social media? Maraming salamat po. Good day to the students of um, LST. I'm Risa Singh San Kaupeng, and I'm the editor-in-chief of Kirigma Magazine. Maybe just to give you a background of um, myself. Obviously, I'm a layperson. I'm married. I have two kids. Uh, and my work in the Lord takes me to the different uh, media. Uh, I do radio. I do TV. Uh, I'm also, well, if you're on TV, sometimes you're on the internet, on YouTube. And um, I'm also on print. Uh, and uh, how do I use this um, different media in evangelizing? Um, as a lay person, um, you know, I, I, I'm not, I, I never studied theology. I uh, have no background uh, in uh, this line of work, kumbaga, uh, except, um, you know, being in a charismatic uh, community since I was a young teenager. Um, so uh, whatever I give, whatever um, I teach, whatever I preach really comes from um, my personal life experiences. I don't claim to uh, make a doctrine out of them, but I do study. I do try to, to study um, our Catholic faith. I, I, lo I love to deepen my Catholic faith. I, I love listening to um, holy people. And um, reading the Bible is uh, something that I've been doing since uh, I, I was a teenager and um, attending Bible studies and prayer meetings. So um, these are the, the places where I get, um, you know, uh, material for my talks. Um, I, I'm also a daily mass goer uh, because uh, I, I say it's a lazy way of, um, you know, getting wisdom. Because uh, when you go to mass every day, you hear the word of God, and then you also hear it interpreted and preached by uh, holy men um, through our priests and um, our bishops. So uh, that's, that's where I, I get my um, inspiration. That's where I get uh, fuel for my preaching. So as a lay person, I really uh, uh, take, um, I, I really look for wisdom in my life as an everyday person. Uh, I, I try to see God's hand in the simple things that happen to me. I, I try to relate um, biblical, what I read in the Bible to my personal life. And um, this is also my way of um, kind of like masticating or digesting it for other people. I always think that whatever life lessons I go through is something that the Lord allows me so that I can pass it on to other people. Maybe, uh, I don't know, I, uh, um, when, I was, when I was a teenager, uh, I was uh, discerning my college course, and uh, I kept on getting a vision of a, a podium. And so uh, at 17, I never thought I'd be a preacher. I didn't have any role models at that time. I, did, I didn't have uh, uh, role models, meaning you know, a, a woman preacher. There was no uh, woman preacher, women preacher um, during those times, you know, not a lot of them, not popular. So I never saw that I would be a preacher um, when I would grow up. So I, I interpreted that 
that vision to mean that, oh, maybe the Lord wanted me to be a teacher. So um, I wanted to take up education as a college degree, but um, things didn't turn out that way. Uh, but look at me now. I am a preacher. My work is uh, really um, figuratively in front of a podium most of the time. But um, now in modern days, uh, I find that the podium can be a camera, you know, uh, it can be uh, a stage, uh, it can be even um, a recording of songs uh, or, uh, you know, speaking in conferences or being on radio. So, um, uh, so as a lay preacher, uh, that's, that's where I, I take uh, inspiration from. I, I like seeing God's hand and, you know, kind of like dissecting um, everyday uh, occurrences in my life and in other people's lives and seeing the hand of God there. So I hope uh, I was able to um, share something that can be useful for you also in your ministry. God bless you. We will now move on to our open forum. And I would like to turn the mic and the floor to uh, our dear friend, the president of the Student Council, Meeks, to facilitate the open forum. Good morning once again, everyone. May I please call on here in front, um, Your Eminence, Cardinal Tagle, Father J. Boy, and Father Kali. And for those of you who have questions, we have a few moments, we have a few minutes to, to, to have this, this portion. Microphones are on the sides. Please approach the microphone and address your question to any of who you want to... Uh... Oh, Father. Uh, Father Nono, also, by special request. <laughs> also Father Nono. All right. Any questions that you have? We have uh, presentations from our very illustrious speakers here in front. Maybe you would like to ask. Ah, there, sister. Yes. Kindly uh, just say your name, sister, and uh, where you are from. Um, thank you for, for the sharing and um, exposure to regarding online. Uh, it's only now that uh, I began to realize how things can be facilitated by doing things online. But uh, in our experience, I am assigned in Malibai, and we are actually facilitating on our 50th year of mission there. We are facilitating the marriage of many of our people. So many parents of our school there called San Juan de Pomoneseno School, so many of them are not married in the church. And because of that, we thought of really facilitating marriage. And one of the difficulties we are experiencing is precisely the requirements on the documents, birth certificate, baptismal certificate, and most especially, you have to go back to baptismal certificates for marriage. And it will mean for poor people, they have to go all the way to the provinces. And some of them don't want anymore to just get the process on because it means they don't have money. So many, now I understand why so many of them do not pursue marriage. And so my question is, is the church also facilitating online with regards to requirements of um, certificates, baptismal certificates, bap uh, certificates for confirmation, and so on? People, I realize that parents do not have a tan. their certificates of their children. And because of that, when they grow up, sometimes their parents are already dead. And so they, they have no more means to even uh, facilitate those things. And so they just don't 
proceed anymore for marriage. And so uh, it poses a difficulty because in school, we do promote the, the teaching, of course, of First Communion. We have adoration of the Blessed Sacrament with the children. But the parents remain uncatechized. We do such an effort towards that. But um, now I see how can we, how can the church go online with regards to these requirements? Thank you. So it's about the wedding sister. So I think it's, uh, I will answer that question. So in our experience at the Manila Cathedral, um, if the certificate would come from another country, they usually email that to us. So they don't need to, to send us the physical copy, but it is easier. In fact, in the U.S., they said they would just email to one another, you know, if there are requirement, requirements that needed to be sent. But here in our country, unfortunately, we do not yet do that. Because maybe for many parishes, they do not even have an email account, no? especially in, uh, in, in, in other places. No? Uh, so I think that, that is a, a good question also and a good challenge for all of us, for future parish priests here no? in your communities. Maybe you could already start doing you know, email and how we could connect to different parishes, to different dioceses through online, no? which is, I think, cheaper and would also be, you know, more effective, no? more, uh, less time-consuming also. Uh, the good news is at least the idea of having church records like uh, baptismal certificates and confirmation and all of that are uh, the, the project, the idea of having them uh, scanned, stored, and then shared no, online is there. Now, the execution, I don't know how, whether, how long it would take, but I know, for example, in the Archdiocese of Manila, we even set up an office now just to study the internal connectedness of the offices and the parishes online. No po. Basta lang, do not ask for baptismal certificate in, uh, no, no, I was baptized 1580. Maybe we don't have, uh, <laughs> we don't have yet you know, those documents. And, uh, but the, the effort is, is, is there. Uh, we hope it will uh, be facilitated and, uh, when we reach uh, the 500th anniversary. We hope. Thank you so much. Thank you also for the question. Yes, we have a sister from over here. Thank you. Um, I'm Sister Daisy from Papua New Guinea. And I would like to say thank you to Cardinal Tagle and the two priests who gave a beautiful talk. I was in tears when Father Gonzalez was expressing himself. Um, in my congregation, I belong to the Missionary Sisters of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, MSC in short. Um, I will be the first one to be studying to do media and when I went into media, it was a challenge, exactly like uh, Father Gonzalez. And I got involved with the generation Y, I would say, the young ones, the young generation, uh, genera uh, generation Z, or Z. And I got myself into trouble the first time my general wrote a strong letter to me. Because I was working with the young people and I wanted to know more about them. So I got into Facebook and I was reprimanded a lot. But I saw the power of uh, social media as Father Gonzalez was saying. And I was able to evangelize and with my Archbishop uh, the Archbishop of Rabal, 
Archbishop Francesco Panfilo, SDB. Yeah, we were able to tackle a multi-billion company, uh, Rimbu, Rimbuhan, Rimbunan Hijau from Malaysia, who had um, illegally did a lot of logging and uh, in one of our Catholic communities. So I saw the power of media through that. And through Facebook, we were able to get Al Jazeera, um, ABC, and all the other media outlets to be with us. Yeah. And Cardinal Tagle, you spoke about um, Inter Mirifica. And I was wondering if our church could make it possible for all the formation houses to go through a formation on uh, media, especially on um, Inter Mirifica, the document from the church. This is important for our superiors, our formators, and even our sisters, and even the priests, so that all of us will be able to uh, look at media in the same level if we want uh, it to be for evangelization. So that is my suggestion, and I would like to thank you once again for a beautiful talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sister. So you're from Rabaul. Yeah, I spent two weeks there in Rabaul. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. People in Rabaul sing beautifully. Yeah, really beautiful music. Yeah, yeah. Now, why did I get the microphone? Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, let me say this. Father J-Boy, uh, he was my former student, and I was happy to see him cry. I told myself, wow, J-Boy is now in his midlife uh, <laughs> transition. Yeah, and I, I'm very happy to see, to see you uh, really going through those phases in life. No? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, and, and you yeah, and, and, and you, you communicate it very well. No? Uh, you know, when, when we talk about evangelization in media, uh, we always think about the world to be evangelized. And, but the church, we need to be constantly evangelized too. No? Uh, that, has, that has been the, the reminder to all of us. Evangelized to evangelize. And uh, as Sister said, as, as we learn about the means of social communication, we need to learn the communication patterns of our present uh, contemporary people. Father Jabel say, listen to those to whom we communicate. Uh, and, and the term that they pe people use there is, what are the communication patterns now? And especially in religious houses and formation houses, you are a mistress of novices. You are a master of novices. You are a rector of a seminary. Do you, do you know how young people communicate now? And that must be integrated in, in, in the, uh, the formation. And we bishops of the Philippines, I think two or three years ago, just for the bishops, we had a whole week of formation on social communications. We invited people from the Vatican and some local people to teach us how to open a Facebook account. <laughs> like that. You know? And you could see how the bishops are ah! <laughs> like that. No? But it was good. We were laughing, etc. And then there was a portion where, how do you handle ambush interviews? So we, we played roles like, uh, uh, I, I am a, a reporter. And, uh, so that, and then we analyzed our own reactions. Media, media uh, 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 education formation is really, really important. And we were very happy, very happy to have undergone that. Now, Father J-Boy, please cry again. again. <laughs> okay, you have to give me the cue. <laughs> okay. 
Um, I recently gave a workshop to the temporary professed sisters and seminarians um, in Mindanao. And the topic was how to use social media for promoting vocations. And I was very happy because their superiors were present. And guess what? And then I began to discover that they have a secret code. They call their superiors gurus. Yes, gurang. <laughs> <laughs> or for those who are not Filipinos, uh, uh, gurang means old. Why? Because their superiors, when I talked to them, they were my, uh, we belong to the same generation, Generation X. And when I surveyed, many of the young religious were Generation Y, and we had three sisters, Generation Z. And so you can imagine the confusion because Generation X will find it really, really difficult to understand the present generation. Let me explain that. Can I stand up? It seems that, you know, I, I'm very kinesthetic. It seems that my brain doesn't work unless I walk around. So I'm like that. So, so the superiors said that their problem is really how to form the younger generation. They want to understand them. But as of the moment, they do not have the tools to understand the younger generation. So my workshop began with understanding Generation Y and Generation Z. Two talks. The first one, I just used the McCann Erickson Youth Survey for 2018. You can download it. And then second, I shared to them my, my studies in terms of forming young people. It's called the Developmental Assets Profile. I measure formative outcomes so that I get to know whether the formation in school is effective in terms of the development of resiliency among the generations. So I told them, what are the needs of the younger generation? For example, support, empowerment, um, boundaries, expectations, commitment to learning, etc., etc. It is measurable. That second talk was an eye-opener for many of the superiors because they said, we are formators, but we do not know what are the parameters in terms of forming. What we do is just what we were formed before, how we were formed before, we just passed on to the younger generation. But the younger generation is reacting to it. You know why? For generation Y and Z, the old way of parenting is not any more effective. Hello, you're still with me? Yeah. So therefore, the way of being a superior to sister inferior, that's joke, Clark, <laughs> um, cannot be patterned according to the old ways of parenting. Second, it also challenges certain practices. I agree that there could be no cell phones in the novitiate, but once they are done with the profession, you see, they're Generation Y and Generation Z. They are used to using technology. And then they said their, their vocation promoter is Gen X. So they do not get vocations because it's still the usual poster. And then in the poster, you get to see the picture of a nun praying. I have to tell them that that is not any more attractive to Generation Y and Z. What Wait. is attractive, attractive to them? If you are on Instagram, <laughs> it is true that people who follow other people on Instagram, they become envious because Father, you have a travel. Father J-Boy, may I ask you something? Yes. Because it's also observed in some parts of the world that the young vocations and priests and sisters 
are of the more conservative type. And I was in a forum and some young people asked, I, do I have a place in a church that listens only to Generation Z? I want to be yes. of the medieval church. <laughs> and that's my that's true. choice. Let me respond. Res uh, let me respond to yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Sige, okay. sige, please. Let me respond. Okay. Sa dali lang. Okay. All right. Um, let me go first to the first thing. For many of the younger generation, what they see on Instagram is also their dress rehearsal for their future. They use Instagram in order for them to imagine what they can be in the future. So if a certain congregation posts pictures and these young people can imagine doing what they're doing, then they get attracted to it. Now, the young people now, there is a certain nostalgia. That's from the, that's from the McCann Erickson Youth Survey. There is a nostalgia because the world is very complicated. They are now seeking simplicity. That is what I was saying a while ago, that at the end of the day, they would ask, who matters to me? What matters? They want to simplify their life because the world is complicated. That is why they are attracted to um, pre-Vatican II um, people because it's a, it's a handle, it's a security. It is something that is very, very concrete. So people are also attracted to that, but some are also attracted to mission work when mission work is more active. So I guess the church has a large spectrum. You can attract them whether in the more, you know. So the world is, the church is very colorful. So you can do that by just asking yourself as a congregation, I told them, who are you? What do you offer the future? And then second, what is important for the young ones is friendship. So do you, do you share your friendship? Can they see that as a community, you are cohesive? That you are friends. That's what they are looking for. And finally, if you share your mission, then they can also be attracted to their purpose in life. So I guess, you see, the superiors want to know the younger ones. But I guess formation is important also for the superiors so that they will be able to form the, their formants um, towards the future. Okay. Thank you, Father J. Boy. And thank you for the additional question from Cardinal. We have time for one last question, unfortunately. Oh, um, Alea is already standing over there. Sige po, go ahead. Um, hi, um, I'm Leah Go. Um, I'm a moderator of a Catholic Facebook group, a Catholic spirituality Facebook group and a website, and I've contributed a few articles to some Catholic websites. Um, so my question is, um, as someone who engages at least a little bit in social media evangelization, I notice a trend of preaching to the choir. So essentially, those who end up following these pages, um, liking posts, sharing them, share them only to, um, are people who are already interested in the faith. And many times, those who, um, who also like, like if I share it and then my friend will share it, our Facebook friends tend to be those who also share our faith. So it, it's like a very, not always, of course we have friends with different opinions, but generally those who even bother clicking on the article um, are people who already have the same interests and backgrounds. So how do you reach people beyond that scope? Uh, that is actually the nature of Facebook. You think that you are um, uh, reaching uh, many people, but actually you're speaking to echo chambers. Uh, so it's the algorithms of Facebook. You know? So um, you, you need to therefore uh, invite uh, or be invited to uh, groups from outside your circle. Um, when I'm asked, what is the difference between what you do in JESCOM and other Catholic media organizations, I always tell them, uh, without bragging about it, that 
that has always been our uh, unique contribution. We, that's why uh, at the start I said we are in mainstream media. We do not want to just preach to the choir. I have uh, two radio shows in, in Radio Veritas, but we, we really like to reach out to the unchurched. So uh, the goal of Jazzcom has always been to reach, to the, uh, to reach the massa, the mainstream uh, media and not the uh, not just the people here so I, I guess it will take some effort because Facebook uh, deceivingly uh, only uh, let uh, lets you talk to your own kind um, face uh, social media should be seen as a secondary um, means vis-a-vis uh, -vis personal contact face to face uh, it is not a replacement. It helps, it enhances, but number one, it will always be face-to-face. -face. So if you do not want to preach to the choir, you've got to engage other groups, meaning physically. My experience is that I would, I would um, be a friend to other people of different faiths, for example, and then they begin following me. Then that way, you get a whole spectrum. Like yesterday, I was with people in commune, and uh, these are people who are from the fringe groups, and we were talking about mental health. So the gate doesn't have to be very religious. Sometimes I've mentioned about advocacy. Um, those are very beautiful gates to enter, and then from there, you can bring people to, to your faith life. Okay. It's also an experience. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Eminence, go ahead. Uh, I would like to thank you for the question and the responses of the two. Uh, re let us remember, we, they are means, no? Means of communicating. And who knows, five years from now, 20 years from now, there will be new, new means of communicating. But uh, uh, there is no replacement to human human contact. And Vatican II's insight, like you have social communications, but you have theater, you have dance, you have arts, you have, uh, uh, which are also potent ways of communicating beyond the group who are connected with you, like uh, in that small circle. So the church's uh, horizon is so vast, we cannot be confined to only one means. And uh, the, 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 we have to, to be, to, 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 to enter all of those means. And human, uh, uh, now I, I visited a community of uh, recovering drug dependents. You must have heard about the Chenacolo, a community. They're all, all uh, recovering drug dependents. They seldom involve a psychologist or a counselor. They just live together, bear each other, listen to each other, and everyday adoration. Each one, that, that communion with Jesus, Thank you, Eminence. Thank you for that question. Unfortunately, this is all the time we have for today, but we would like to invite you to our groups online so you can view these, uh, this, this uh, video and uh, also the video of Sister Risa Kaupeng in our Facebook pages, Loyola School of Theology and Loyola School of Theology Student Council. And also, you may address your individual questions to our resource speakers here. And on behalf of the Loyola School of Theology and the Theo Hour Committee, we would like to thank, first of all, all of you who are here today. Please give yourselves a round of applause, especially to all our guests and visitors. We also would like to thank Jesuit Communication, Father Nono Alfonso S.J., Father Kali Liamado, Father J. Boy Gonzalez, SJ, 
and of course, His Eminence, Cardinal Chinto Tagle. Thank you so much. And may I call on um, Brother Cesares Mosetti, SJ, and Sister Mary Denise Libutake, RA, to please to hand you um, our humble token of appreciation. May we invite um, Your Eminence to please give us your final blessing. The Lord be with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you kindly and grant you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.